this here is basically my Saturday morning cartoons when I was a kid. All we had to look at was uh, cowboys, like Lone Ranger, and Roy Rogers, Hopalong Cassidy, the Cisco kid. And this is about 1956, so I'm about four years old there. And that's my sister who was born in 56, and obviously she just, you know, just was born. But I'm on that, that uh, the diaper pail and the uh, good old fashioned telephone we had to. So now what, what got me interested in drawing first off uh, was Spider-Man. Um, I was about eight years old when this comic book came out. And uh, I was camping out in the backyard in the woods with my friend uh, and just reading comic books by flashlight and uh, he pulls out this exact comic here, Spider-Man number four and I just was like oh my gosh what is that I've never seen that before he said well it's a new comic company that just started up called Marvel and so I immediately traded all my comics I had for his couple of Marvel comics he also had a Fantastic Four comic and this is where I really started wanting to learn how to Steve did go at Spider-Man, made him so good at spider man looking. I just loved his artwork. Um, so I would just take the comic and kind of try to draw what he did over here. And uh, eventually you start doing your own poses and that sort of stuff. But that's what got me started. Um, this is Jack Kirby. Anybody not know who Jack Kirby is? This is Jack Kirby created Captain America, Iron Man, Fantastic Four almost the entire Marvel Universe. Uh, Stan Lee was the writer and he was the co-creator, but uh, Stan lived a lot longer than Jack did. Jack died in the mid nineties and he didn't get to take advantage of the, the Comic-Con scenes like Stan did. Uh, he, Jack's whole career, he struggled to pay the bills. Uh, so he worked his butt off, but uh, you know, Stan in the, the later years just walk into a building and make $125,000, you know, for the weekend. But uh, this was one of the main guys that uh, created the Marvel Universe. Again, one of my influences was uh, Jack Kirby. And, and this is Steve Ditko. This is the guy that did Spider-Man. Uh, about three or four years ago, he was in his 90s, and I went and, and introduced myself to him in his office. Uh, he was like the last one that I wanted to meet that I never got to. He's very reclusive, so I was afraid I was going to get him angry, but he was very nice. And, uh, I just thanked him for helping inspire my whole career. Because really, without Spider-Man, I don't know if I would have ever done this. All right, now this is uh, me and Stan. This is back in about 1990. And uh, I actually showed this picture to Stan and had him sign it you know, a couple of years later. And he looked at it and he said, hey, wow, you used to have brown hair. <laughs> And then he looked a little closer, he goes, hey, I used to have hair. <laughs> so Stan was a character, and uh, really one of the only reasons I put this uh, slide in there is to show you that I had brown hair. Now, that's all gray. Now, this was one of the first Saturday morning cartoons. This was back in the late 50s, uh, but they really didn't call it Saturday morning cartoons yet. It was just a cartoon on Saturday. And this was uh, Crusader Rabbit, and that's Rags the Tiger. Anybody? Seen this before? And this, this is old. <laughs> I was still a pretty young kid. And uh, it ended up being, later on, the inspiration for a, a show that probably most of you heard of, Rocky and Bullwinkle. So Crusader Rabbit was like Rocky, and Raggedy and T. Tiger was uh, Bullwinkle. Same sort of idea. Uh, this was a little bit later, maybe in the early 60s. This is called Beanie and Cecil. Now, Cecil was the sea sick sea serpent, and uh, Beanie was the little boy with the cop, uh, the cap that had the copter on, on the top of it. And um, this was really a big cartoon for me when I was a kid. It had a lot of uh, sight gags. You know? And Bob Clampett, who created Beanie and Cecil, was actually the creator of Bugs Bunny and directed a lot of those great old cartoons uh, with Daffy Duck and Porky Pig and all those characters. And I got to meet him. Uh, really late in his life as well. And it was really so, we didn't have cons. So man, I wanted to meet all these people that I grew up loving. So you guys are lucky you come to see us. But uh, but he was a really great guy and this was really influential in my childhood. 
then there was something called King Leonardo. So, uh, Tudor the Turtle. He was a turtle that was very unhappy with his life, and he would always have this wizard change him into something else, and he would become this other thing that he always wanted to be, and then it didn't work out. He'd have to you know, call, cry for help and get called back. But that was a cute little cartoon, too. Uh, Courageous Cat, Minnie Mouse, this was like Batman and Robin. Bob Kane, the creator of Batman and Robin, actually did this cartoon. Uh, this was the very first Hanna-Barbera show called Rough and Ready. This was before Huckleberry Hound and before Yogi Bear. But the dog had exactly the same voice as Huckleberry Hound. So when Huckleberry Hound became more popular, uh, they said, well, we really can't re-show really Rough and Ready. It's just too much like Huckleberry Hound. So it's really one of those shows you never really hear much about, even though it was the very first one that they ever did. And of course, there's Huckleberry Hound, uh, Underdog. These are just things that I loved as a kid. There's Rocky and Bowman uh, Now, 1972, I graduated school in 1970, and I start working at the uh, GM factory in Van Nuys, and I'm welding these things together. Um, our union, in all its wisdom, decided we needed more money. So they struck and went on to strike for more money, and they promptly moved the plant to Canada. So I got no more money. In fact, now I have no money. So thank you, Union. So then I went over, and I ended up being a bus driver. And this was in LA. And these are actually some of the buses that I drove early on. They bought a bunch of really old buses from Atlanta, and they expanded the LA bus terminal. And uh, no air conditioning, it's like 100 degrees. And two speeds, so it was slow as molasses. But this is when I was uh, driving and I had a day off and I happened to go out and get the trunk mail that came in the mailbox and threw it on my kitchen table and I sat down to eat a sandwich. And there was this little pamphlet. And so as I'm eating, I kind of pick this pamphlet up and I start thumbing through it. And it's the Cal State North, which was, was a uh, college near us that was holding summer classes. And one of the classes is a comic book class. So that catches my eye. And I see that the teacher is a guy named Don Rico who drew Captain America in the 50s. So now I'm really intrigued. So I decided to take this class in the summer. And the first, first day, he asked us to bring our portfolios in. So whatever we had drawn, just bring it in so he could check it out. And then we were basically going to create our own characters and make our own little comic book during the, the course of the class. So after the class, after he looked at my portfolio, which was all Spider-Man and Fantastic Four and stuff, um, he asked me to come up to the table because everybody's leaving. And I'm like, uh-oh, what the heck did I do? I'm in trouble already. And he said, look, I work at Hanna-Barbera as a storyboard artist. And um, we're doing a new show called Challenge of the Super Friends. And I really like your artwork. And we have people that can draw Fred and Barney because they're not real human. But we need people that can really draw superheroes well. Understand? And I said, uh, he said, we could use you. And what we do is we have a class that at Hanna-Barbera, it's free. All you have to be is recommended by one of us. And uh, would you be interested? And I said, no, I'd rather be a bus driver the rest of my life. No, so of course I jumped at it. And uh, so man, next thing you know, I'm at that Hanna-Barbera Studios, which I used to, ironically, that was my route. I drove right by Hanna-Barbera Studios every day. So I went in there, took the class, and it was every night, every Thursday night for about three hours, and they said, okay, we're gonna do an in-between. I don't know what an in-between is. So they had to show me what an in-between is. So I struggled to do that. It took me a week or so to get the, the first in-between done. It was terrible. And third week, they said, okay, we're gonna hire four people out of the class. There's probably 30, 35 people in the class. And they name off the names. I'm one of the names that they're going to hire. I'm like, what the heck is going on here, right? I don't even know what I'm doing. So uh, I went to the director that hired me and I said, look, 
I'm thrilled to death. I mean, I can't believe this is a dream that I haven't even dreamed come true. But I don't know what I'm doing. So, I mean, you're going to hire somebody that doesn't, I'm going to struggle. And he said, well, we're going to put you with an animator. You're going to be his assistant. And, you know, he said how much I was going to get paid, which was better than the bus driver job. But I still thought I didn't want to quit the bus driver job because if I crash and burn, you know, I'm losing a really good job. So I took a leave of absence for three months. And then maybe about two or three weeks into it, um, the animator I was working with said, uh, you know, you're picking this up pretty quick. And so I finally took the step and, and quit the bus driver job. Okay, and this is the Hanna-Barbera building that we were doing this at. Still there, but now it's a, uh, a bunch of apartment buildings. Now this is uh, Bill and Joe at a storyboard session. Uh, later on, they started doing storyboards and they would just make them this big and pages and pages of them, so you didn't have to have them on a big wall like that. But they used to hash this out with all the animators and the directors and stuff. Now they just gave it to you. It was more up to you to understand how to do this. Luckily, I'm still just an assistant, so I, I don't have to know all that because there's a lot of uh, a lot of math. Because every time the characters move on screen, the camera has to move a certain amount, and you had to know how to make it go faster and how to slow it down by the fractions that you had to put down on it. So I didn't have to do any of that, but I learned uh, over time. You learn, and. Uh, this is me, this is my first day. I look scared as heck. But that's my first day at Henry Barbera. Now, was the picture okay for you guys? Because sometimes I know the angles will look kind of, it kind of glares. Could it come forward a little bit? Yeah. Okay, that's all right. Good. Shoot it. Okay. All right, so there I am. I'm nervous as heck. This is what the building kind of looked like just before they closed it down and put it, made it into the apartment buildings. Uh, they started, before you would never know it was Hanna-Barbera. I mean, it said Hanna-Barbera above, but you never saw any of the characters or anything. Now they put all these panels on the front of the building. So it got to be a really uh, interesting point when they take people on tours in Hollywood and stuff. You can go by the original Hanna-Barbera studio. Now, this is the very first show I actually did a drawing for. Now, the first show I was hired to work on was Super Friends, but uh, they were doing about four or five different series at the time. Uh, this was the first thing, and I've got on my phone, I've got the very first drawing I ever did of Fred Flintstone from this show. And, uh, and Super Friends, of course, worked on that. Scooby-Doo, I did the Scooby-Doo post of Hollywood. And then also the Scooby and Scrappy Hour. Yeah, this is that's one of my drawings from the Scooby Goes to Hollywood. He's uh, it's supposed to be like the Fonz. And I actually met Henry Wigford. I gave him a drawing that I did of Fonzie as Scooby Doo. He loved it. I did Godzilla. Captain Caveman. The Smurfs. This show was evil. <laughs> because every time you drew something, you had eight characters you had to animate. So, you know, yeah, they were easy to draw, but each one of them had to move differently. So you had, you know, if you had to do a certain amount of foot, footage of film every week to make your, you know, your quota. And if you got Smurf stuff, it was like, oh. Because if you got, like, say, 80 drawings of one Smurf times four, times five, I would make. So it was really difficult, even though they were easy to draw. Uh, this was the Finn show. Now, this wasn't the thing from Fantastic Four. This kid found a ring, and when he said, uh, thing ring, do your thing, it would turn into the thing. Uh, this is something called the, sh the Shmoo. <laughs> it was a little shapeshifter character. Oh, and then I did a, uh, Anna Barbera had a ride in Universal down in Florida. And it was one, kind of like Star Tours, or it was a, a, a flight simulator, but you, uh, Dick Dastardly kidnaps Elroy, and then you chase through Bedrock, and through Jetsonville, and past these haunted mansions that are all in 3D uh, to get, try to get him back. And I got to do uh, that Astro. 
uh, what happened was that Joe Barbera draws Astro and he comes off the paper and starts flying around and talking to them. And then Dick Dashley comes in and kidnaps him and takes him into this other dimension. And then you're on the ride chasing him. I'd never seen the ride. I'd never been on the ride. So I just did this work and never saw it again. But I finally found it on YouTube. And uh, so that's the Elroy that I drew. I did a whole bunch of different things as well. Then uh, in 1980, the, the business was when the season's over, you're basically laid off until a new season starts. And then whatever studio is hiring first, that's usually where you go. So I moved over to Ruby Spears from Hannah Barbera. Now Ruby Spears were two guys who worked at Hannah Barbera and they broke off and started their own company. And then I worked on Plastic Man. And Penny Blonde, that is actually going to be Shira in a few years. That's the same voice as Shira. Did Heathcliff the Cat? Uh, my favorite of all, Thundar the Barbarian, which was done uh, by Jack Kirby. So I got to meet my hero working at Ruby Spears. Totally awesome. He gave me his address and phone number and said, come on over to the house. It's like, how the heck can you do that? You know, it was so cool. Oh, now, 1981. You've heard this before. The union decides we should be paid more money. So the union goes on strike. Well, all the studios close and send the work to Japan and Korea. I'm back down to no job again. Now, the only thing good for me was Filmation Studios. Lou Scheimer refused to send work overseas. Everybody else did. So the only studio left to work at was Filmation. But when I heard that they were asking for more money, I said, okay, that's it. So I called up a friend of mine in Filmation and got hired over there before everybody ended up wanting to get hired over there. And of course, over there, this is uh, Norm Prescott, Hal Sutherland, and Lou Scheimer, who was the head of the studio. Super great guy to work for, just really friendly, uh, really cared about his workers. Otherwise, he would have sent the work overseas too. But that was his thing. It's like, all you people are my friends. I'm not gonna put you out of business. So that's why if you ever see E-Man, there's so much reused animation, we had to get our budgets lower to compete with Japan and Korea. So we would reuse animation and just change, back, change backgrounds. But at least we stayed in business. You know, people would say, oh, you're lazy, and you, know, you weren't talented. But no, we were so busy and uh, under the pressure to, to keep the studio open that uh, we had to do all that. And then this is the Filmation Studios. This is in San Fernando Valley. The building's still there, but now it's a bunch of different, like there's a dentist in there and some stuff like that. And uh, that's from across the street because they took over that building. Because now we had probably a thousand people working in the studio. Because um, everybody had to work there. And over there I worked on Flash Gordon, Tarzan, Fat Albert and the Cosby mm -hmm. Kids, uh, Shazam and the Superpower Hour with the Hero High. Uh, this was the, actually, finally in 1981, I became a full-blown full animator. I had been doing a lot of animation and showing the directors. And they finally said, okay, you know, you could be an animator now. So I, I finally moved up the ladder, and this was the first show I got to animate on. And this was just before he met. And there's he met. Yeah. And we got she -Ra. And this, okay, this was the big controversy. We did a show called Ghostbusters. Oh, and everybody was like, you're ripping off Ghostbusters. No, this was our original show back in 74 called Ghostbusters. It was live action, same idea, Ghostbusting, they had that gorilla. Well, they ended up giving that the franchise of Ghostbusters to their kids, and the kids was the cartoon. So they had to, we had sold the name Ghostbusters to Dan Aykroyd for like 200,000 bucks or something, so they could use that for the name of their movie. But we still own the rights to that, so we just did Filmation's Ghostbusters. And that's this one here. And see, the ape is still in it, so that's supposed to be the, the original ape. And uh, this was a pretty fun little show, but it confused so many people because they just couldn't understand why it was Ghostbusters. And uh, there's a whole transformation sequence in this show 
when they're in their regular uh, street clothes and something would happen and they'd say, let's go Ghostbusters and they give a big high five and then machines would take and put their clothes on and they'd be on this conveyor belt and up this elevator. <laughs> Me and my friend did that entire sequence. So every episode they showed that sequence. So that was a real feather in our caps that we had something to show them every week. It was pretty cool. This is the studio we worked in. This is what it looked like. And this is like moving day, because they finally, we had so many different studios around the valley, because we were so big, that we find a bigger building to put us all in. They finally found one. And that's it there. It was about five stories tall, and everybody could fit in there, and it was a much better situation that everybody could work together because we had runners that had cars that would drive and work back and forth to these different uh, buildings. And there's me at my, my studio desk and I still have that desk, the disc and the little lamp and the wooden shelf behind me. That's in my studio at home. When they went out of business, I bought everything. So that's pretty cool. I'm a, I'm a real collector. So it's like a, that room that I live in now is just covered in stuff. I've got my I've got the pencil test I told you that I didn't do very good on. I still have the pencil test. Uh, then Brave Star. And then finally, in the late 80s, we were working on the show called uh, Bravo. And these are the little prairie people from the Brave Star show. And then there was also a show called Bugsburg. But I went a little too far forward. But when they closed the studio, the Westinghouse owned Filmation and they needed some cash. So they decided to sell Filmation and they promised they would sell it to somebody who would keep the studio. Well, they sold it to L'Oreal, the makeup company, and they promptly closed us. So 1989, the, the ironic thing about it is it happened on February 3rd of 1989. Now, February 3rd of 1959, was the day the music died when Buddy Holly was killed in a plane crash. So that same day, 30 years later, is the day that animation died in the U.S. So now I'm a freelance artist, so I have to go out looking. There's no real studios anymore, so you just kind of hear through the grapevine that so-and-so is looking for some animators. So this is a video that I worked on uh, called Opposites Attract with Paul Abdul. So I worked on the MC Scat Cat and uh, that was a lot of fun, and of course, it was really popular on MTV, so it got a lot of fun shows. Did a lot of commercials with the 7 Up spot. Oh, and then I worked on a, this is a special called uh, Babes and Bullets, where uh, Garfield is like in a film noir film, and he plays Detective Sam Spade, but Spade like you spade a cat. And this won an uh, Emmy Award, so it's one of the only Emmy things I've ever worked on that I won an Emmy Award for. So now, finally, one day, we're, me and a friend of mine are looking at MTM Studios. It's a live action studio, trying to get work just cleaning up because they paid pretty well. And then we figured we'd yeah, become an assistant cameraman or something in live action because animation's done. Well, we go over to the studios, and one of the guys there that we knew said, Oh, I thought you were here because you worked at the animation studio across the street there. And we kind of looked at each other. Animation studio. And yeah, one of the guys that worked at Disney started his own company called Bear Animation. Dale Bear was the guy that, that did it. And uh, they're looking for people. So the next day, I'm working on Roger Rabbit. And oh. here, here I am looking for just a job, hoping to clean up and sweep the floors. And next thing you know, that's Dale. He's one of the best animators Disney ever had. And uh, sadly, he just passed away maybe about a year ago. And, but he was, uh, I mean, I'm a pretty good animator. This guy, I mean, I would take all day to do something that he could do in like 20 minutes. He was that good. Super good guy. And I worked there until uh, 1990, and I worked on a lot of these commercials that were like Roger Rabbit where they put the Disney characters in live action. And I got to work on some of the, like the hippos, the getting into the, uh, there was a Chevy Lumina commercial. <laughs> and they get in, and of course, you know, the, the car's moving like it would on Roger Rabbit, and then we just had to add the, uh, the 
hippos. So I got the, this is actually one of my drawings from the the uh, back seat of Scotch Garden, and they're playing with an ice cream cone, trying to fight for it, and it spills on the on, you know, on the seat. And so, don't worry, it's Scotch Garden. And I also got to work in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which was you know, the first Disney film. Uh, then this is Tummy Trouble. This is the uh, Roger Rabbit part that I got to work on. And got to work on all three characters, you know, the baby and Jessica and uh, Roger Rabbit. Then we also did Prince and the Pauper, which was a Mickey Mouse short. So this was my chance to finally work on Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, and Goofy. And that was the first time they'd been together since the 40s in the same movie. And I even got to animate when, when Donald gets really mad and starts jumping up and down and swinging his arms and all that. They gave me the old original drawings and said, "Watch well, it, kind of follow this, but do them in the new costume that he's got." So I got to you know, touch these old 1940s drawings and stuff, and so that was really cool. Then I worked on something called Rover Dangerfield. This is Rodney Dangerfield, um, and it was a really, really good little movie. But they had difficulty because. It wasn't quite young enough for kids, and it wasn't quite adult enough for adults. So uh, it made it difficult to release it. They released it in a couple of theaters, and it did pretty well, but they finally got scared and just pulled it and released it, the video. And then eventually we saw it on Disney Channel. And these are a couple of my drawings from that. And this one, I was a key assistant, because now I was living in Seattle, and I was just sending work back and forth, FedEx. Yeah, these the wolves are going to attack this turkey that he's supposed to be guarding. And then here's where the, the wolves kill the turkey, and he's trying to pretend that the turkey's still alive. And the drawing, I did this whole scene, but there's a drawing where he picks the, the head up with an eyelid, and the eyelid's like stretching all the way out, and he's going, oh, 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 trying to make it look like, and then the farmer sees him and thinks he killed the turkey. And so now they're going to kill Rover because he killed their turkey. And then I did uh, We're Back. Not Thumbelina, yeah, Thumbelina. And then I became a director. And I did all this through the mail. And I worked on Duckman. Anybody see that one before? Yeah, and that's George Costanza from Seinfeld's voice. He was kind of a really rude detective. Uh, directed King of the Hill. So if you ever saw an episode where Bobby got caught smoking, I did that episode and a couple of others. He makes him smoke all these cigarettes. And, just, and then they all get hooked on cigarettes. So <laughs> Hank and Peggy had quit. Now they're stuck smoking again. Uh, did something called Road Rovers. This was about the same time as Pinky and the Brain. It was a Warner Brothers show. Uh, Extreme Ghostbusters. Oh, that's um, Extreme Dinosaurs, Savage Dragon, and then a bunch of fairy tales for HBO, uh, where they have different takes on the fairy tales, like Pinocchio was a black puppet, and Will Smith would slap everybody. No, that's what he did in real life. <laughs> he, he was the voice of Pinocchio. <laughs> and now this is where we go through kind of the animation process that we did back in the days. And like I said, I'm probably giving the joke away, but we used to use something called a pencil to draw. And we had these things called cassette tapes that we would get the voice track on. And that's, that's how we were able to direct the shows. So the animation process, okay, first you got a script. And once the script's done, it gets sent off to a couple different places. One of the places is the recording studio which right next to me is Larry Kenny, who's the voice of Lionel from uh, Thundercats. And so he would record the voice tracks so that we know what they're saying, and we listen to them on the cassettes, and then we kind of picture what they might be doing, you know, to be able to get them to act. Because while he's the voice actor, I'm really the actor. I'm the one that makes the character do what he's gonna be doing. And so they get that done, and at the same time, they're making that storyboard that I talked about before, which is like a comic book that shows every scene and how it's going to be. And then each one of those storyboard panels is blown up into a called a layout. 
the layout's done about this big, which is the size of the cells that you see out there. And uh, that really shows us how big the characters are in the scene. Uh, in this case, you can see they don't have any legs because they're standing behind a table or something. So now we know where the table is, so we have to animate behind the table. This is the model sheet department. These are the ones where they send it off to the designers and they give all the animators, everybody, complete turnarounds so we know what they look like from the back, from the top, from the side, everything. And there's the Wonder Woman one. Then it comes over to the animation department and we would draw in blue pencil. And it's because blue pencil isn't picked up by Xerox. And we would draw in blue pencil, the assistant, which I was to begin with, would clean it up in a black pencil. And then when they film, they film it, or they put it onto a cell, it scanned onto a cell and the blue wasn't picked up, so all the sketch marks and stuff didn't show up. So you have this nice clean cell that they would then paint the back, paint the back of. And that's kind of an example. You can see the blue pencil underneath the black pencil. And then there's a little chart, and that chart tells the guy where the in-betweens go. So that would be like drawing number one and drawing number six or whatever, and then you have to do number three first and then number two. It's all in order. And it's basically, if this is drawing number one and this is drawing number five, well, drawing number three is right in the middle in this. So that way, it'll open up. And that's how you get the motion. These are the sheets we use, and the dialogue is written down the center, so we know exactly what frame, what he's saying. So if he's saying, look, that's why we know his mouth should go, ooh. And uh, it's all down the center, and this one here, you can see a little bit. So if it says, look, it might be this long. So you've got like maybe eight drawings, and the first one he's gonna have his tongue, you know, ooh. And, then, and so all that has to be drawn out. It's time consuming. <laughs> then they Xerox it onto a cell, flip the cell over, and they paint each cell. And they start with like the, maybe the teeth and the eyes. They have to wait for them to dry. So they, they got these things with shelves like crazy. So you put it there to dry. Right there. By the time you get done with the 10 or 20 drawings you have to paint, this one's dry. Now you can do the face. You know, so it's each color. And just to make it more confusing, because there's five or six cells that can be at each level, every cell you put on top, it makes the color down below darker. So you have to draw the color, the top cell, a lighter color, or a darker color, because the bottom one is going to be dark. So you have the, the, the flesh tones match colors. They have like flesh one, two, three, four, five, and that depends on what level it is. See the letters there, that shows what the paint is to be used for those characters on one level. And there's the He-Man version. But each level, you'd have to know, you know that this is on the cell on the top, so that's gonna be painted darker than the ones down below. But when you put them all together, they're all gonna be the same shape. Pretty complicated. And that's kind of what the cell looks like on the back when you get done painting it. And then this is a cell with the original drawing behind it. And this is the folder that each one of the scenes came in. So each scene, there were probably 250 to 300 scenes. And we would go pick up our stack of work for the week. It was like maybe 20 scenes you'd get. And that's what you did for that week. And everything on the bottom here is what background they're going to use, gives you the whole spiel of what episode it is, what scene it is, and then down the side, it's got all the people that sign off. When you're done, you sign there. That way, if there's a mistake made, they come back and get whoever did it to fix it. And nowadays, with computer, you don't have to paint anything anymore, so each color, there's, there's no cell layers, so you just use the color. If you make a mistake, instead of having to re-Xerox it and repaint it, Delete, just delete it, paint it, delete it. So now you've gone from like 150 painters needed to maybe 15. So good for budget, but not so good for the 
135 people that just got laid off. There was a background department that painted all the backgrounds, and especially on email, they were pretty cool looking. This is what the, the uh, thing looked like before they painted it. They would sketch it, a blue sketch, and then paint it in watercolor or uh, acrylics that were really thick cardboard, and that's what you'd see behind each cell. And then this is a Flintstone version when it's all done. And it goes to the camera department where they have cameras like you see, the cameras facing straight down. And the camera operator puts the background and then the cell has this thing called a platen that flattens everything down to make sure there's no shadows or spaces. It takes two pictures of that, pulls it up, puts the next cell on it, close it down. If the background's moving, it's got to move the background eighth of an inch. Eighth of an inch, put the new one on to take the thing off. Another one on, another eighth of an inch. So when you see the background going by like this, it took hours <laughs> to get that thing to do that. It looks really easy on TV. And then this is actually one of the cameras, and you see that thing that's right in front of them. That's what it flattens down on to hold everything down. And we use these same cameras. These are from, from the 40s, and they were such excellent cameras that we used them up until the computers took over. Then it goes to the editing department where they make sure each segment fits between the commercials to the frame. I mean, it's got to hit it right there and the commercial takes over. And at the end, too, when it shows over. So the editors clip out whatever they need to get rid of from each scene that isn't necessary to, to hit those uh, times. Then it goes over, they add the soundtracks. You know, it was a magnetic tape back in the day. They add that to the film. And then you have your episode, and, which was awesome, but it was even better when you saw your name on the credits. <laughs> so there's, and this is one of the things Lou did for us is like, instead of just having, you know, 60 names this big that run by so fast you can't even see it, he split it into two different sections, and each one of us got like five seconds on the screen. Because he was like, you guys are the one that did this work, so I want you to get the credit for it. So it's, it was pretty cool. So nice to work information. And nowadays, I live in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and I play the drums, and that's on my worship team at, at church. And I also play guitar and bass, but I usually play the drums. And uh, so that's kind of, that's what my panel was. So now if anybody has any questions, uh, shoot them at me and let's see what we got time for. So yeah, we got like 10 or 15 minutes left. So, anybody have any questions about anything? Yeah. You know, I created stuff on my own, but yeah, that wasn't my, yeah, that wasn't my deal. It's like the guys that created the characters, they could never animate them. So, we had to work kind of in concert with them because we would have to tell them, you know, what you're creating here is too hard to draw. It's going to take forever. And if you've got to draw, because it's 12 drawings per second. That's why things would walk and stop, and then they'd just talk. Because <laughs> it was too expensive to, to do full animation. Right. Uh, so like He-Man, you notice the toys, you know, his belt has circles on it, he's got circles on his arm bands, and things on the gray part, well, we had to get rid of all that because it's way too much to draw. Because you have to animate each one of those things moving, you know, just too hard. But uh, yeah, everybody had, there was a design team, a storyboard team, a layout team, an animation team. That's all we did. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. If you're right into this like, conflict, yelling matches or anything, with any of the teams that you Oh, no, we never had yelling matches. <laughs> yeah. I laugh because there's, there's going to be a special come out. It's uh, going to be on Netflix, I think. Has anybody seen the toys that made us? OK. There's another one called Power of Greystone that's on Netflix, and it's kind of more on He-Man. They're doing one that's just basically on filmation. So last week, they were out at my house for about four hours filming in my studio with my animation desk and everything behind me. You know, ask me questions that they'll put into that special. I don't know how much I'll be in it, but at least I'll be in it. And uh, 
So that that was the kind of the cool part about. I had moved away, so I didn't get to go in the other ones, and I, I wish I would have. But you know, they didn't want to move out. Well, they they were willing to fly, so they flew to my state of Idaho and came out and brought the cameras and everything. So that was really really cool. And uh, so yeah. So anything else? You can dominate. It doesn't matter. Well, would, did you know that the he map would have such an impact, such a cultural impact? You know, it's so funny. I've been in Ecuador, I've been in Dubai, I've been in Alaska, I've been in Florida. Everybody asks that question. Everywhere. So, I mean, it's really, it's a good question. And it's like, you know, not really. You know, we, we were desperate because the Black Star just ended, all the studios were closed, we didn't know what was next. Uh, a normal season of, an, of like a show like Scooby-Doo or Flintstones or something, there's only 13 episodes. And they play the first run in September and then repeat it two times and then that was the, the season. Well, with, with He-Man, what Lou Scheinman decided to do was to make, make a series and sell it instead of having someone buy the series from us and then we do it. We did the series and then sold it. So we did 130 episodes, and the first 65 were done. And we sold it to all of the channels, like channel 11 or 5 or 13, that, you know, it wasn't NBC, CBS, and ABC. And all of a sudden, instead of doing just an episode on Saturday morning, we were doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, after school. That changed the whole business, because I never got laid off again. I told you, we used to wait, have to wait for the studio to pick, figure out what we're going to do next. From that point on, we just worked all the time, and it was great. But we knew it looked cool, uh, but a lot of things look cool, and it just doesn't take off. The fact that there was going to be a toy, and that the toys were already out, was a first. Nobody ever made a cartoon of a toy. It's usually the cartoon comes, and then they make the toys. And it was, uh, you know, really well received. And it was one of the first things that when I went out to dinner with a bunch of my friends, and somebody would say, hey, what do you do for them? And I'd say, animator. What do you work on? A uh, He-Man. Oh my gosh, my kids love He-Man. You know, everybody knew He-Man. So, but it was a shock that it was that big. And that, you know, next year is the 40th year since He-Man came out. And that it's still, you know, it's still big. All right, anybody else? Are we? All right, very good. Got, got All right, sure. I think that somebody just recently rebooted the email. Yes. Sorry, Next the question, email? please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't match up with ours. Yeah. And that's the one people love. Yeah. And they keep redoing it differently. I say, do it. I like our show. Just make it for 45 year olds instead of 40 instead of six year olds. Yeah, right. And you'll have billions of fans, but they keep changing it so that you know nine tenths of the people don't really care for it. Because it's not he man, it's something somebody else caught came up with. So but yeah, that's another question I get all the time. And so yeah. I, I didn't think it was that good. Animation wasn't very good because it's all in computer. They, what they do is if the character jumps, like he's gonna jump and land. That's a drawing, and that same drawing moves all the way up to here, and then they change the drawing to one where he's got his legs folded, and then there's a one more drawing to go, and then one even lands. So there's five drawings. Well, when we did it, there'd be like 25 drawings to get him to do that, so that he would, you would see the action as he was tumbling. Now it's just faked, and, and so it just doesn't look as good. But a lot of the people don't know the difference, you know, so that it's cheap to do it that way, let's just do it that way. Anyway, guys, thanks so much for coming, and come yeah, out, check out my table, and uh, if you haven't bought anything, buy something, or not, just say hi. <laughs>